Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to a new edition of the Indian Express Explained Live, our series of online explanatory conversations with domain experts and authorities on specific subjects. I am Monojit Majumdar, editor for Explanatory Journalism at the Indian Express. As some of you might be knowing, we have been doing these events for almost six years now. And I always begin with a line about Explained Itself, a section of the Indian Express that is very special to us. Explained, the content on our in the paper and on our website, as well as in events such as this one, is rooted in the news, but it goes beyond just the news. So it is context, it is background, it is connecting the dots, it is analysis. And in today's noisy news environment, an explanation of the news, why is something happening, what will happen from here on, how is it going to impact you, is perhaps as important as the news itself. This evening, we are talking about perhaps the biggest story in international media right now, the crisis in Ukraine, and what could, in the worst case scenario, end up in the biggest military land offensive seen in Europe since the end of the Second World War nearly 80 years ago. Russia has circled Ukraine on three sides with between 100,000 and 130,000 troops, tanks and other military hardware and is setting up supply chains that countries usually do in the final stages of the preparation for war. Why is President Vladimir Putin, who appears to hold a fairly weak hand given Russia's economic situation, still ratcheting up pensions to a seeming point of no return? Is he bluffing or will he invade? Why are the loudest protests and the scariest scenario building coming from the US and UK, which are physically and economically the farthest from Eastern Europe? Why is China posturing on the side of Russia as Putin takes on the West? And what stakes do we in India have in all of this? To answer some of these questions we have with us this evening, Dr. C. Raja Mohan, visiting research professor at the National University of Singapore, contributing editor on foreign affairs for the Indian Express, and one of the sharpest, most experienced analysts of Indian foreign policy and global geopolitics. Raja, thank you for your time. We are delighted and very grateful to have you with us. Great to be here, Manoj. Speaking to Dr. Raja Mohan will be my colleague, Chief Diplomatic Affairs Correspondent of the Indian Express, Shubhajit Roy. Shubhajit has been writing on multiple aspects of foreign affairs for a decade and a half now, and has been tracking the crisis in Ukraine and has written about it in the Indian Express. Later in the evening, Dr. Raja Mohan will also take a few questions from the audience. Today's explained event is brought to you by our associate partner, Yojana IAS. My thanks to our partner. And thank you all for joining and welcome once again. Shubho. Thank you. Thank you, Manojit. Uh, for that kind introduction. And it's indeed a privilege to uh, moderate this uh, conversation with Dr. Raja Mohan, whose writings we've all read. And I've had the privilege of interacting with him in person over the last decade and a half. Uh, before I come into Dr. Raja Mohan, I would just want to uh, you know, set the context by reading a paragraph from a book that I recently started rereading. Uh, I read this book by a uh, uh, former, I mean, uh, New Yorker editor, David Remnick, uh, which is called The Lenin's Tomb. Now, Remnick used to be the uh, uh, Washington Post correspondent in Moscow uh, in late 80s and early 90s. Uh, I think uh, he was uh, from 86 or 87, he reached Moscow and he left Moscow in 1991. Uh, so uh, he wrote this book called The Lenin's Tomb, the, which is the last days of the Soviet empire. Now, as I was, I had read this uh, book and he's about, a, about a, a decade ago, and now I started reading it. And one of the uh, paragraphs really jumped at me when I, uh, and I will just re read, read that paragraph where he, uh, Remnick now travels to travel to different parts of then Soviet Union and he goes to Ukrainian city of Lvov. So he writes, and I quote, on a trip to the Western Ukrainian city of Lvov in 1989, I met with small groups of nationalists 
who promised that one day their republic of over 50 million people, the biggest after Russia, would strike out for independence and do far more damage to the Union than the tiny Baltic states ever could. They knew their history. And then he quotes Lenin. He says that Lenin once wrote that for us to lose the Ukraine would be to lose our head, unquote. I think uh, this sort of paragraph and Lenin's uh, quote that he, that essentially reflects how Moscow sees the situation today. Now, I would request uh, Dr. Rajamohan to sort of explain to our viewers uh, who are also readers of the Indian Express uh, to about the issue in a little bit of detail. What is the issue at hand right now? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Shubhajit. Uh, it's uh, quite amazing how uh, seemingly tranquil Central Europe, uh, which has been uh, at peace, uh, you know, with no military tensions uh, since the end of the Cold War in 1990, uh, today promises, as Manojit said, a potentially a conflict that could, you know, you know, resemble first time huge land war in Europe uh, since the end of the Second World War. So it's quite an amazing turn of events that we've seen uh, unfold uh, in, in the heart of Europe in the last uh, a few weeks. Uh, in terms of what is the crisis that we have today, I mean, it is a multidimensional crisis. And let me briefly sketch out the five of the dimensions uh, that are in play today uh, in, the, in the current crisis uh, over Ukraine. The first is a deeply historical and political question. What is Russia's position in Europe? Is it part of Europe? Is it outside Europe? Is it a friend? Is it an enemy? So what is, what is Russia's position in Europe, which is the uh, oldest in terms of the modern era uh, where the nature of international relations uh, and the modern world was defined uh, in Europe. So if you look at uh, the last you know, three or four centuries, Russia was very much part of the European order. It was one of the great powers, which along with, you know, before Germany came, there was Prussia, uh, with Britain, with France, with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, with the Ottoman Empire, decided the structure of European politics for centuries. Uh, but the 1917, the Russian Revolution, the Communist Revolution in Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, fundamentally put Russia at odds with the rest of Europe. Uh, they, the, the West Europeans tried to defeat the revolution. Uh, Russia was supporting revolutions in other, other European countries. And the conflict between the two was not just about power, power politics, but it acquired a deeply ideological character in 1970. Uh, so that began the conflict between Russia and the West. And But in the, in the middle of the Second World War, uh, the West needed Russia to fight fascist Germany. So Russia actually worked with the West to defeat the uh, Axis powers, that is uh, Germany, Japan, and Italy. And the Red Army played a huge role uh, in the success of the Allies in the Second World War. But the Alliance did not last long. And within four years, you saw the old uh, Alliance break down into deep enmity between Russia, the Soviet Union then, uh, and the West. So they were again at the daggers drawn, this time with nuclear weapons, with massive armies mobilized against each other. We thought the end of the Cold War in 1991, where the Cold War came to an end, now it looked like in 1991 that Russia would now once again become part of Europe, that it will be integrated into Europe. And that was the Russian ambition to get back. Because after all, don't ever forget, for all the posturing with China, the friendship with us, Russia wants to be part of Europe. So they thought they can get back into Europe in 1991. In the 90s, they didn't pay as much attention. Uh, and the, But the idea took a big crashing by the end of the decade. Russia found itself being treated as a defeated country, a country which was neglected, uh, whose interests were ignored. Therefore, today, when Russia mobilizes 100,000 troops, 130,000 troops and says, look, uh, enough is enough. We want to come to some basic understandings uh, about Russia's interests, Russia's role uh, in, the, in the regional security orders. So, so what is at stake in, in a sense is very fundamental for Russia that it needs its rightful place uh, in, in Europe. So that is the political historical dimension. 
The second is the beyond the political and the, and the historic, there is an immediate question of security for Russia. You remember in the Cold War, there was the NATO, that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization of the Western powers. There was a Warsaw Pact of Russia and its East European satellite states at that point of time. So in 1991, the Warsaw Pact collapsed, the Russian military alliance collapsed, but the Western alliance survived. A lot of people thought it was a smart idea to dissolve the uh, NATO and create a single structure of European security. But the NATO persisted and not only persisted, but kept expanding closer towards Russia. So therefore, Russia you know, began to object to this uh, from the late 1990s. Look, uh, we don't pose a threat to you. Why are you trying to take more countries into NATO? And the perimeter of NATO is moving eastwards, closer and closer towards, towards Russia. Uh, so for Russia, this was increasingly unacceptable. Uh, and they felt that, look, this expansion of NATO uh, is creating problems for Russian security. Therefore, Russia now needs to draw a line and say, look, no more, this is enough, we're not going to accept anymore. And we want to reverse, which is what the demands put by Putin to the West a few weeks ago, saying, look, we need security guarantees. We need to, need to stop NATO expansion further. And we need to reverse many of the decisions that were taken since the late 1990s on military weapons deployments, uh, the integration of uh, Eastern Europe into the NATO structures. So a whole range of issues relating to specifically you now weapons, uh, deployment of nuclear weapons, uh, where should the forces be deployed? Uh, these kind of issues, they all need to be taken a look, a fresh look, and that they want a clear, time-bound, urgent guarantees. Otherwise, the threat of a Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, seemed imminent. So, so that's how the crisis began when the Russians moved troops and laid out these massive demands uh, for, the, for the United States. Uh, the third aspect of the crisis is the Russian idea of reconstituting, that is, we all think that Humpty Dumpty, when it falls, it can't be put together. But at least the critics of uh, Putin, uh, President Putin, say, look, uh, what Putin is trying to do since he came to power in 2000 is to put the Humpty Dumpty back, that he wants to stitch back the old Soviet Union in a different form. You know, they have this East Europe, East Asian, uh, East Europe, you know, uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, he's created a, a central uh, a security organization like the Warsaw Pact, this time with a lot of the former members of the uh, of the Warsaw Pact and a lot of the former members, not Warsaw Pact, former members of the Soviet Union. Uh, he's trying to reconstitute a political, military, economic reintegration of what was the Soviet space. Of course, you're not actually integrating them, but you're creating institutions and structures for uh, putting together the Humpty Dumpty of the Soviet Union into a reasonable place. Now for Putin, uh, the idea that, look, in, in a recent speech, uh, he wrote that, look, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. So a lot of people say, look, Second World War was, war was worse. Uh, you know, First World War was as bad. Uh, many of us in India say the partition was probably even more as deadly as, as what happened in, in Europe. Or there was a bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But for Russian nationals, the collapse of the Soviet Union was a great tragedy. And that is the feeling that Putin says, look, it was a terrible thing to have Russia, a Soviet Union break up. And that it was his mission to bring it back together to the extent that he can. He's already been in power for 20 odd years. Maybe he'll last for even another 10 years. But the fact is, he sees putting Humpty Dumpty back as his great legacy for Russia uh, and his contribution to Russian, uh, Russian history, and that he thinks Gorbachev made terrible mistakes, and uh, it was stupid to have dissolved the Soviet Union, and that we need to put it back. So that is his fundamental proposition. And the West says, look, uh, this is trying to carve out the new Russian sphere of influence. Now, that the West says today, no such thing. We can't just accept uh, Russia gaining a kind of veto uh, over its neighborhood, that it must sanitize the neighborhood, uh, and that, that whatever happens in this space, the former Soviet space, as well as Eastern Europe, Russia has a decisive stay, uh, and that there is no question of the West accepting it. Uh, many of the former Soviet republics, like the Baltic republics, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, they say, look, we are, we're quite happy outside the Soviet Union. Uh, give us, I mean, why would we want to go back in? 
Uh, we'll come back to the Ukraine question, but a lot of countries don't want to go back. But for Russia, it believes that, look, in fact, recently, a very paternalistic sense, I mean, of saying that these former Soviet republics are like fatherless children, look at them, they're in such a sad state, uh, that come back to daddy, that daddy will take care of. But when your children, once you leave, I mean, it's very hard to get them back to daddy. And, and I think that's where it's not just the West opposing Russian case for reconstituting Soviet Union, but many of the chaps who have broken away don't want to come back in. And that creates uh, even uh, greater friction. So I think this is uh, really the central uh, theme that Russia as a great power needs its sphere of influence. Of course, a lot of people say spheres of influence is nonsense, but America has one in the Western Hemisphere when they talk about the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, India talks about the Monroe Doctrine of its own. Like we say, look, South Asia, nobody else should come in. We tell the Nepalese, look, if you bring the Chinese, there is hell to pay. Uh, we tell the Sri Lankans, sorry, you can't get the Russian Chinese ships into your, into your ports. So all, all large countries tend to seek a sanitized zone around. In that sense, Russia is trying to do the same. China is trying to build one. Uh, in uh, today in Asia. So realists in international affairs say, look, spheres of influence are actually part of life. The question, problem is not with the concept, which is unequal, which is uh, defers to the interests of the great powers as opposed to the interests of the smaller countries. But that's part of life. Big guys do, big powers do what, what they can and the small guys have to endure. That is the mustanya, if you will. Big fish eat small fish. That's the story of international relations. And that this is a reality and that they must be way found. This is, the, you know, this is the people who say, let's negotiate and settle this question instead of simply saying no sphere of influence. Some way of accommodating Russian interests becomes uh, the, the those who say, look, making a case for engaging Russia, uh, say that look, you need uh, this kind of uh, understanding with Russia on how to work out this arrangement how much of a Russian role, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, uh, that's what is being negotiated. The fourth uh, set of, fourth dimension of the crisis is what should be Ukraine's international relations? That is, a no to NATO, I mean, no Ukraine in NATO is the main demand that Russia is for. Okay, you come this far, I mean, um, enough is enough, but you, you, know, you give me a written guarantee that Ukraine will never be admitted into NATO. But NATO's problem is they have promised Ukraine that they'll take them in, in 2008. But practically speaking, in fact, Biden has said this as much, President Biden, look, there is no way we can take Ukraine. It's not going to happen tomorrow. So I can tell you I'm not going to take him. But the Russia said, no, give it in writing that you, you will never take it. See, Russia, the uh, Europeans and the Americans say, look, there's no way we can say that. We can't say, you know, Ukraine has no right to choose its own security. Therefore, there's no way I can, I can accommodate you, but I can't give you a legal guarantee. But Russians say, I want it in writing. Today, you say they, you won't take them. Tomorrow, you want to take them. What do I do? So I want a legal, legally secure guarantee. So that is the other uh, point of contention. What should be Ukraine's international relations? Yesterday, uh, we saw the French president uh, talk about, look, is there a way of neutralizing Ukraine? We can come to discuss this in, in terms of solutions when we come there. But the fact is, how, how does the Ukraine's nature of its politics, nature of its foreign policy must be determined now? Which is, I mean, it's not, again, a shocking thing. We say the same thing, but Nepal should not. We had actually a treaty. It's not operational, the 1950 treaty. We said, look, India will guide Nepal's foreign policy. And Nepal is hated. So that's a part of the problem that, that small countries and big countries have to deal with each other, neighbors. Uh, but So this is one point. No to Ukraine and NATO. The other uh, point that Russia is making is no NATO in Ukraine. It's all right, you say, look, I won't take Ukraine into NATO. But if you want to deploy all your weapons in Ukraine, that is NATO comes into Ukraine instead of Ukraine going into NATO, that's also not acceptable. So no Ukraine in NATO and no NATO in Ukraine. Therefore, you cannot deploy weapons. You can't do a whole lot of things in Ukraine. And that Russia has a veto. Now, this is, I mean, a sweeping demand. I mean, uh, if you're a Ukrainian, if you're a Nepali, if you're a Sri Lankan, if you're a Maldives, uh, if India makes similar demands, I mean, it's, nobody likes those demands. But you have to find a way now to deal with this. We can go into some detail on this. But, but here is the fundamental question. 
Russia is saying, I want a veto over Ukraine's foreign policy. And okay. Ukraine is not acceptable to Ukraine, nor is it acceptable to the West. So, and finally, the nature of, there is a problem of Ukraine's domestic structure. So it's not just about Ukraine's international relations. There is also the problem of Ukraine's inter internal relations. There are large Russian-speaking populations. Russia has already taken Crimea. Shubhijit, I'm just finishing with this point. I mean, then you yeah. have the Eastern Ukraine, where Russia has backed the uh, independent entities, which are Russian-speaking territories. So Russia wants deep devolution of federalism, of a deep federalism. Ukraine says, we can't do this. So therefore, how to do this is the other question. This is not very different from, we tell the Sri Lankans, they've all power to Tamils in North. But the question is the terms of it. It's very hard to negotiate somebody's internal politics. But that's what Russia wants, and that's where the problems problems are. So, so I'll stop here. Uh, Shubhiji can take it from there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajamon, for sort of <clears throat> explaining the broad sweep of history, politics, and also how big power, smaller powers in the neighborhood, uh, the, the clash of interests, or there is a, uh, there is a desire to to maintain a sphere of influence that sort of uh, has been shaping this narrative. But I mean, some of the things that I would come back, but one of the things that struck me about your uh, initial remarks is that how Putin considers uh, collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest tragedy or greatest catastrophe, whichever way you want to translate the Russian phrase that he used. Uh, uh, and uh, it, is, it actually comes from his personal experience as uh, an agent, as a KGB agent in East Germany when the when Soviet Union collapsed, and how he felt heartbroken about it. And now with the uh, uh, eastward expansion of NATO, with uh, almost uh, 14 states joining NATO post-1990s, uh, uh, that has sort of weighed heavily on his sort of mind. And uh, in 2007 or 8, I think, at the Munich Security Conference, this was the first time he raised this issue at the uh, Munich Security Conference. Uh, but right now, I wanted to know, uh, in July 2021, that is last year, he wrote this piece at the Kremlin website, uh, which, which uh, talked about this historical unity of uh, Russians and Ukrainians. And it's a long 5,000-word 5, uh, piece, which uh, some of the critics flippantly said that he must have a lot of time at his hands. But in in that, he argued you know, about the commonality of history, culture, linguistics, everything. My only, uh, and then since December last year, sometime, he started ratcheting up the rhetoric. So my uh, question to you is, why is President Putin raising this pitch right now. What is uh, about the timing right now? Look, as I, as I mentioned, for him, this is the question of legacy. I mean, he's been in power for 20 years. I mean, he, he's succeeded in reviving the Russian economy. He's kind of revitalized the country. So he sees, look, the, the injustice that was done in 1991 must be corrected. And one reason he thinks that at this point, he thought probably, maybe wrongly, the West was too divided. Uh, US wants to go into Asia, so Indo-Pacific, so they're distracted. So this might be a good, and, and remember Biden actually reached out to Putin, unlike Trump and uh, Obama, right in the beginning of his administration said, look, uh, let's, let's come to some kind of an understanding of Europe because I want to, my problem is China, therefore let's settle in Europe. But what Putin has done is to raise the stakes dramatically, hoping that this is a moment in which he can actually strike a deal uh, that is favorable to him, given the circumstances in Europe finds itself in. But the problem, you know, whether it succeeds or not, that's what history will tell you. But history is cruel. Look, I mean, you can't undo how much you feel badly about the past. Can you undo history? Look here, I mean, a lot of the people in the audience today, I mean, their parents, their grandparents, they've all seen partition of the subcontinent. Tragic, terrible, what happened in the Punjab and the Bengal. But today, are you going to say, look, I'm going to undo that tragedy? Can I undo what happened in partition? You can say, look, Pakistan, what is Pakistan today? It was part of India in 1947. 
Bengal was one place, historically same space, using the same type of uh, language that Putin is using for the former Soviet Union. Can you now say, is India's right to put it back together? So the question is not whether the claim is right or wrong. Can you do it? Do you have the power to do it? Or do the Pakistanis and Bangladesh, if we say, look, we should be part of India, will they accept it? Akhanda Bharat is a great idea. Why don't you just come back in? We were all one happy family till 1947. Let's get back together. So I think the, the trouble with trying to, you can transcend history. You can overcome the bitter legacies. Not easy. But can you undo the past and reconstitute the space? And I think that is a, where he's put himself against a, a set of demands that are really impossible to achieve. That's what it looks like at this point. He can get some of his demands met because the West is eager to move on to Indo-Pacific. So they might be agreeing to that. So the question then becomes, how much will he negotiate? But at this point, uh, it, the, the, the gap is, is huge. And uh, here is, is where, uh, what does he, what does he, what is, does he, does the demands that he put across, are they the beginning of a negotiation or are they, you know, positions from which he can't retreat? Therefore, either, either you know, double acquits, I mean, either you actually give me all that I demanded or I go to war. Can he do that? Because this is the problem in which he has put himself in. Uh, I, I see that probably he's already overreached, uh, whether he can settle for something less than this absolute demands he's put together. Uh, is the is the big question uh, what will this crisis uh, produce right right you made a very interesting point about uh, you know can you uh, undo history in fact uh, you know uh, i think none of the modern uh, nation states have had the same borders in, since time immemorial so where do you draw the line do you if tomorrow uh, the british uh, decide to reclaim the colonies uh, do you go that far? Or as you rightly said about India and Pakistan and its neighborhood, uh, where, do you, where do you stop? So uh, my, uh, my uh, I mean, I wanted to understand from you, you've also been reading a lot of Ukrainian uh, point of views. How does Ukraine see this uh, crisis from sitting in Kiev? Uh, President Zelensky is in a very difficult position right now. Uh, so. Uh, from your perspective, how do you see Ukrainians' uh, view on this particular scenario? Actually, there's so much common between India, Pakistan, and India, Russia and Ukraine. The similarities are quite, uh, in many ways, I mean, it's no, no two situations are absolute. Uh, so I think there is a problem. We don't need the British to come back and say, take them by that they can't. But we're still fighting over it, right? See, Pakistan thinks it can take Kashmir by force. It can't be 75 years have gone by. Uh, a lot of countries have historic memories. Uh, who want to take back territories, which they say in their national history belong to them. Uh, China says, look, whole of South China Sea was mine. China says, you know, Arunachal Pradesh is mine. Uh, so you have, China says Vladivostok, even Eastern Russia was once part of China, therefore it's mine. So, you know, everybody has a past in which you are a bigger country, you are a larger civilization. Therefore, we don't need the West to make claims on us, but we have our own competing claims between ourselves. Uh, so Turkey now says, look, it has got, you know, uh, you know put, put back the great Ottoman Empire together. And no Arab would want to go back into Turkey or the Ottoman civilization. And that is the crux of the problem. That India might say, look, we, we used to say, look, Ukraine, uh, Pakistan, you know, if you go back to the early partition days, oh, Pakistan is, you know, can't survive. It's an artificial state. Oh, there is a matter of time they'll come back in. It didn't happen, right? So this idea that just because you had a shared past, uh, you will have a shared, you know, you can go back to that past uh, is, is very difficult. And I think that's where the problem uh, between Russia and Ukraine is. Uh, the Russians have a narrative. Yes, this is Russia, Ukraine and we were so close. Uh, we were, you know, there was no such thing as a Ukrainian nation. There's no such thing as a Ukrainian script. Not, you know, they were Ukrainians also being new nationalists. They want to change the script from Cyrillic to Latin. So once you introduce nationalism, ethnic nationalism, it creates a logic of its own. Uh, and that going back to the past uh, becomes very, very hard. So there is a story, if you think of Ukraine alone, I mean, look, the borders in Europe have shifted far more violently, far more frequently 
than 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 South Asia, even in the last 75 years. You look at the 1945 settlement did not hold, the borders did not hold. You saw a number of countries break up around the time of 91. And the settlement made in 1991, that also did not last. Number of countries of, you know, Czechoslovakia became two, uh, Yugoslavia broke up. So Europe has had massive number of changing borders. In India, we only had one, I mean, which is the Bangladesh uh, becoming separate in South Asia. Uh, so Ukraine was in the heart of Europe, is the biggest country after Russia. But its, its history shows, look, Russians were part of it, Poles were part of it. Uh, everybody was taking a, a, a pie when, when they could, and the borders kept moving. So Ukrainians will dispute, naturally, Ukrainian nationalists will dispute the Russian claims. Oh, come on, you're a prodigal son. I just come back into the fold uh, and that everything will be fine, that we can go back to baby born. I think they, they, don't, they don't agree with that. Um, and the fact is, for whatever reasons, Stalin <laughs> made sure that uh, Belo- uh, sorry, Ukraine, along with Belarus, had a vote in the UN General Assembly in 1945. They had a separate seat. Because that was done for convenience, so that Russia gets two more votes in the UN General Assembly. But the fact is, you were given a separate seat. And for a short while in the interwar period, that is after 1919, uh, Ukraine had a free, for a short period, an independent existence. But then as Russia and Germany fought, uh, once again, they disappeared. So there is a long history of struggle within, within uh, and uh, the episode you quoted from David Remnick's book. It tells you there is a nationalist sentiment which always resented being part of Russia. But there are a large number of people intermarriage over a period of 75 years, you know, a lot of shared culture, all that. There was a lot of integration as well. But there was also a lot of resentment. And both both exist. And today we're seeing the sharpening of, of, the, of the resentments from the from the Ukrainian side and Russia trying to uh, pull it pull it back in. So, so both sides have enough in the in the history to claim a shared heritage or a separation, a separate history. So I think both sides are doing that. So the question is, you know, history is a guide, but you know, you can't undo undo history and go back to where you were unless you're a very powerful state and you can integrate everything around you. So here are two questions come up. Is one thing for Russia to say Ukraine was always part of us, but Ukraine must say that, right? No, for me to say, Nepal, guys, look, you are just like us. You say that to Nepali, he'll flare up. Because he has an identity of his own. You tell him, look, you just like us, you you know, you should behave like you're Indian. Or you tell that to the Pakistanis, okay, there's no chance. So you tell that to the Sri Lankans, you tell that to the anybody else, look, let's all get to be one happy family. But they're not, they, they're actually trying to define themselves in opposition to India. They're the old Soviet states are trying to define themselves in opposition. But can they live in peace? Here, are, here is what is needed. Russia, if it provokes, it kind of bullies its neighbors, he's trying to look for balancing actors, right? This is what they try to get some other big power to protection against Russia. And for the smaller country, if you play this card too far, for example, tomorrow if Sri Lanka gives a base to the Chinese, because India is going to do crazy stuff. So the big countries have to win over the small one. And the smaller one should be careful not to provoke your big neighbor, because once, like that's how Crimea happened. That's why some territories already lost for Ukraine. So I think this is where the prudence and balance of trying to get together with the new historical circumstances is a big challenge, but but it makes it very hard in a nationalist mode to be able to produce that an understanding where both of us live in peace. Still, look, Russia is doing very well economically. Ukraine is one of the poorest countries in the world today. They've done so badly. And the nationalism is going to make it worse for them. But then how do you overcome a, a nationalist resentment and focus on what is the collective good for the country? That's the challenge. Right? So, uh, you know, I'm just reminded about your, you know, uh, uh, your parallel with India and, uh, you know, Pakistan and India's neighborhood. I mean, Russian imperial thinkers, uh, I uh, formulated a concept of the tripartite Russian nation consists of the great Russians or uh, Russians in today's understanding of the word, little Russians or Ukrainians and the white Russians or the Belarusians. So uh, you could see how how intertwined their sort of shared culture, history they had. Uh, now, coming to the present uh, situation, we've seen this massive mobilization of troops uh, along the border by Russians, 
uh, there is uh, with equipment as well. Now, is there a if cause for concern for for escalation? What is uh, what is uh, what is your sense when you see at the reports generating uh, from from DC or from New York or from Europe? Uh, do you see there's a cause for concern? See, look, there is cause for concern. I mean, if you're a pessimist, you say war is inevitable because there doesn't seem to be much room to retreat for Putin. He can't really get back. And the kind of demands he has made, it's very difficult for any country to accept those demands, not only for the West, but also for the Ukrainians. So you have actually fairly you know, rigid positions on both sides. The only hope is that they're negotiating and the issues that are at hand are very complex. Uh, and uh, so, therefore, it is going to be very, very difficult to prevent a, an escalation of the crisis. But on the other hand, if you're an optimist, you say, look, 100,000 troops are no good to invade a country of 50 million people. And the size, which is, as you know, second largest after Russia, it's the biggest country of Europe. Can you really take a country? Can the Russians actually sustain a military occupation of another country uh, for, for another country like this large country for uh, any, any length of time? What would be the cost? Uh, U.S. Is, and West is threatening massive economic sanctions against uh, against uh, against uh, uh, against uh, Russia if they actually do it. So you have actually a pretty uh, 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 difficult situation out there. Uh, and the, there are nuclear weapons on top. As an optimist, if you're a realist, you can say, look, there are nuclear weapons for all this. There are, you know, Ambassador Piers Ragun has been writing regularly saying that, look, this is a drama. This is a drama of raising, playing a huge military poker that both sides are playing and trying to negotiate with such high stakes. So that if, you, if you're a positive guy, you say, look, this is really uh, raising stakes to get a real good deal for both sides. And that actually, because of nuclear weapons, because of the cost of war, there's going to be no real, uh, real conflict uh, of the kind that we, we talked about at the beginning. But others would say, no, we're not talking about full-scale invasion, but there could be a whole, whole lot of other things. There could be cyber attacks. There could be a coup in Ukraine, a pro-Russia coup organized in Ukraine. Uh, there could be, Russia could move in, take away a few slices of territory. So there are less than the total war. I think most probably that is where the trick is. I mean, that how those scenarios might play out as opposed to full-scale, you know, head-on confrontation between you know military ingress by and Biden himself said, look, that 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 if it is less than actually troops crossing border, maybe Biden, you know, America might not react the same way. So is there a room there in terms of, uh, of what less than a total war situation? Those I think those scenarios are likely uh, more interesting than simply saying either war or no war at this point of time. Right. So there is there are. Uh, possibilities of different grades of war or conflict or tension that you uh, mentioned in the escalatory ladder. Uh, now, sitting in New Delhi, you know, uh, a very straight, simple question that comes to our mind, why should India be worried? It's so far away. Does it matter to us? Why should India be worried? No, we should be worried for a, for a number of reasons. I mean, I think, uh, I would say, look, the last 30 years when US and Russia we're getting along with each other, it's been very good for us because historically we were closer to Russia, we had problems with the West. Uh, but this idea of we could engage all the major powers, it gave us a lot more freedom on foreign policy side. But if they start fighting, uh, we're going to have serious uh, difficulties uh, and that your foreign policy uh, will find it harder to manage uh, if the major powers start fighting. Uh, then what happens if there are sanctions, serious sanctions? We already have catch up, uh, which is uh, s 400 we buying, buying from the American Russians and the Americans. Uh, the law says there should be sanctions. We're still not clear whether Washington would give us a waiver. If, if they don't give us a waiver in this new situation, that, that will be a problem. Uh, we have large number of uh, Indians in Ukraine. Uh, for example, about 20,000 students. That's one number. Uh, we'll have to get them out. More importantly, oil prices are going to shoot up. If there is a war of any kind, that you Oil prices cross 100, uh, hit 120, 130. Remember, there was a time when they hit 140, 150. Indian economy just about to take off. And it will have serious consequences that inflation already high in India. Therefore, your economic prospects in mean, a huge oil price hike that could come from this war uh, will create problems. 
and there is one other issue which has not been debated much in india uh, but but it is it is of concern to delhi which is if russia says look i have taken you uh, crimea i have done a referendum and therefore now 90% said they would like to join russia so therefore it is mine but india has a problem with the notion of referendum that that you can take somebody else's territory in the name of ethnic solidarity religious solidarity do a referendum and say this is mine say tomorrow if pakistan does the same thing in pok they drop the drama of being independent uh, azad kashmir and say look okay here is a referendum they've joined us will india accept it when so this in fact when referendum took place in crimea the huriyat in india you know in india issued a statement in kashmir see referendum is a great idea let's do referendum in kashmir india has agreed to referendum please do a referendum and let's be done with it so i think that is a, you know for, for india this always a major issue of what is territorial integrity and can this be altered by force and can this be altered by somebody saying uh, i am ethnically different therefore i'll have a referendum and let me go out of india so so i think that is really a huge challenge uh, we've not debated this because of friendship to russia i don't want to talk about it but the fact is what they've done in crimea and if they do it again in eastern ukraine uh, i doubt if india will ever support that kind of an action that's a very interesting parallel with kashmir uh, keeping in mind especially because now it's again in the news with this hyundai uh, controversy you know that has happened in the recent days uh, i wanted you to kind of dwell a little bit about india's position uh, the diplomatically the position it has taken so far i remember in 2014 uh, i was uh, in the in the briefing room when then national security advisor shiv shankar menon uh, said and our jaws dropped when he said that russia has legitimate interests uh, uh, during the annexation of crimea and now uh, at the un security council where india abstained uh, at the at the procedural vote whether it needs to be discussed issue needs to be discussed or not and then issued a long statement calling for diplomacy but then it said that that legitimate security interests of all parties need to be respected so uh, if you could just uh, unpack that india's position and why for our our listeners for our viewers this there is nothing to unpack i don't you remember uh, shubhajit i mean two days after mr menon made that statement the foreign office walked back a little bit right yeah they didn't put it in those terms yeah. Uh, and since then since 2014 i mean india's relationship with the west has dramatically increased our relationship with europe has increased so you're not going to simply say we like the russians therefore uh, russian interests are everything i mean but you know ukraine has interests uh, we you know we have interests uh, so i think our interest is in a peaceful resolution in a diplomatic settlement and and that's what india is saying but the problem for us of course is we don't have control over the situation you know we are not the deciding actor but whatever happens will have effects on us therefore at this point for us uh, to say look nudge both sides to the extent through words uh, please solve this problem peacefully don't get into blows with each other in europe that's the only thing we can say but if they come to blows uh, we have to deal with the consequences uh, so i think the russians will put pressure to to look at us please give us some support Uh, we are, you know, in this terrible situation vis-a-vis the West. West will say, "Look, we are your buddies. We are part of the Quad. We are part of all this. Uh, are you going to be with the Russians, or are you? Uh, do you stand for any principle of, uh, you know, one country should not take over another country?" So I think you'll get into all kinds of. Remember the Iraq invasion, the Kuwait invasion. I mean, all kinds of problems can come up. So, so, so it is just the the beginning, and and I think the the challenge will be for us if things really go out of hand, and there. Uh, what has changed from 2014 is that our interests with the west are far deeper today and our economic interests are largely with the us and europe today uh, and you saw putin xi, xi jinping summit xi jinping didn't mention ukraine in the joint statement even the chinese will say look okay you're fighting with them i don't want to be you know i have problems i have problems with europe i don't want to add another problem i can make a general statement about nato expansion but i'm not going to simply walk in and support you. and this is going to be the problem for the russians look if you're fighting with another big power everybody is going to judge their own interests i mean this is not run on sentiment right this is not a sant samaj international affairs so people calculate their interests even chinese are not going to go full hog with them and indians there's no question of we putting ourselves out uh, to defend the russians uh, when they get into ukraine so 
uh, but we would prefer we not in that situation and that's where we are yeah yeah i mean india has in a very difficult situation position because it has to do a tight rope walk between no, so you know it's not a difficult situation no the, no difficulty is you don't have control over the situation okay. you have to deal with it but if it happens you deal with it right and the clarity that look you're not going to back russian aggression in ukraine you will keep saying look get together and solve it you have to find a way to prevent western sanctions on us those you have to do it i mean there's no choice there it's not difficult or hard but the, the situation demands that you have to take care of your own interests right right so with russia i mean we have a historic relationship uh, and india indians have a very sentimental view of russia from the time to soviet union and but the relationship has changed in the in the recent uh, few decades uh the it's now rests mostly on defense because 60 to 70% of our supplies equipment it comes from there uh nuclear cooperation space these are the areas where really the meat of the relationship is there uh if you could tell us i mean is uh russia uh, the defense partnership is that the key reason why we are we have to support uh, russia or is is india able to delink that from its position if it has to vote against russia look that's where abstention comes in look you know in the end in a world everybody is on their own nobody is obliged to anybody else so we should be very clear on that that in the, when it comes to the crunch each country is on its own that's what there are sovereign entities in the international system Uh, and it's not that you are somehow obliged just because you have a defense relationship the defense relationship is important but we're going to tell the russians look i mean uh, you find a solution uh, are russians going to say look we will stop supplies to you because you staying uh, abstaining in the un or you going to oppose the invasion of course initially you remember 1980 in the uh, afghan invasion india did not like the invasion india said so in fact that time our dependence was even more higher so therefore it is not a either or choice what has happened what you said look on the economic side weight of russia is steadily declined our trade is only 10 billion you cover the visit of putin as well we keep talking about raising it it's really stuck at around 10 billion while your trade with the americans is around 150 billion dollars a year the europeans is around 130 140 and china which you have a problem is also 120 billion dollars so russia's economic challenge is declined. there is defense there are nuclear uh, supplies so but is that are you going to use only that Uh, to put your risk in the other other parts of it nation that's where you'll make a judgment but on the principle of military attack one country against another country uh, this time I mean, in ukraine i mean i remember indira gandhi telling uh, uh, russians look we don't accept it we might not criticize you in public but we don't like what you've done in afghanistan which has created all kinds of problems for us with pakistan with jihad and a whole lot of things that have happened so it's not that look india is not just if the russian weapons stop we're not going to collapse it's important you don't want that to collapse that doesn't mean you simply stand up and say whatever russians do we're going to stand behind no country can do that as i said chinese are not doing it and i don't see how india can do that right the, on the other side is the india's relations with the us and the west and there we see this uh, you know growing relationship with the us the quad is going to take place for us is going to take place in the next couple of days and uh, west is uh, sort of uh, been a critical partner economic uh, uh, partner of india as well europe uh, being the foremost now in this kind of situation from in india's relationship with the west with us how much does it again beholden india to take a position in 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 uh, in their favor just because look we have a solid economic relationship with the west that is very it's become bigger by the day and as i said look the us and europe they're the biggest relationship you have a diaspora today which is uh, doing so well in the west us uk australia uh, europe this where indian diaspora is doing very well so you have actually this deep links with the west today and you are because of the china question our relationship is now strategic it's not just about money it's not about business we need to balance china therefore you need the west to work with the west but that does not mean if the american say look either you vote for me or you are against me but india is not just going to accept that logic 
that is you are now stand up and be counted with us in in you know so so we have room to bargain in fact my sense is when the big boys you know india is not small anymore it's a, on its road to becoming the third largest country so we can navigate this with some finesse uh, take strong positions on principle but at the same time make sure that our interests are met uh, say, you know in this in this kind of a situation and where if you look uh, that that there is, it's not as if you are just a helpless baby standing there as i said we are a large country large economy we have deep stakes the deeper interdependence with the west we need the weapons from russia within that it's difficult but it is not impossible to navigate this and that it is not that you have to stand up with one or the other that there is actually room uh, to to stand up for specific principles while telling the russians look we can't accept it and telling the americans look please negotiate a deal it's in your interest because we think what russia is doing actually makes all of our job in asia that much harder because you're taking the americans back into europe just when we need to deal with china and what russians are doing actually helps china to become far more easier for the chinese to dominate asia when our interests are in securing asia and a quarrel in europe affects us but i think we should we have to tell our russian friends look you are again making a big mistake about did the same thing of supporting the chinese in the 50s and you paid a price but you're doing the same thing and for the americans to say look agree find a deal with the russians because with the russians on your side it's easier to do bigger things in the world so we have to make keep making the point to both and make sure that our interests are secure right in fact you led me to the next sort of issue that i wanted to come in is on the russia china sort of uh, relationship and we have seen demonstration of it this week itself at the beijing olympics uh, itself where putin uh, was one of the guests at the inaugural ceremony which india diplomatically boycotted all the center lone athlete a skier from kashmir uh, but this russia china relationship uh, it obviously for india from india's perspective it uh, it looks like it is problematic or you think it is a leverage that india has over china or you think this relationship is counterproductive to india's interests the yeah, leverage with china comes from our relationship with the west not with russia because there was a time russia was helping us to deal with china we talk about the 60s and 70s and for that you have to understand the china russia relationship itself look i mean these countries in one lifetime i mean if you go back to the 50s both of them were communist countries mao and stalin had a security pact an alliance by 60s they were fighting with each other and 70s you know all the russians used to soviet diplomats in delhi campaigning saying no no you know china is bad you know let's you know work together against china that was the song in the 70s but in the 80s they normalized the relationship in the 90s with the with the chinese and 2000 now they come and tell us we are your best friends we will mediate between you and chinese you know so let's all three of us get together and fix the america they do get for their own interest look I mean, they're not you know i think there is some of the may some of be married to the russians we are not nor are the russians married to the chinese no each one of us is calculating our interests at a given point of time and trying to secure the best way we can get our interests uh, you know secure our interests therefore as i said look the different phases of us russia china relationship in the last 70 years is gone ups and downs so there's no guarantee that it will go on and russia china today is 10 times bigger than china in the 50s china was the junior partner today russia is the junior partner and the russia that is fighting with the us and europe what value would it have for for china they're going to treat the russians even more badly if we didn't back use the word ukraine in the joint state china in this joint state why would they want to go out of the way to support the russians so i think there are contradictions between russia and china we shouldn't so we should probe for that Uh, and we go by our interests just as russia is doing securing its interests and within this uh, i'm uh, quite confident that we have a problem with china and look whatever else happens the central point today is our problem with china is real is deep and is unlikely to change so our interests are depending on how do i balance china whoever helps me in that uh, we we have to go go in that direction right now we've talked a lot about the escalation the crisis the dependencies i want to now talk about the de escalation part i mean there's been diplomacy going on in capitals in europe in 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 moscow in 
in uh, in the US. Uh, the European leaders have been meeting uh, both sides. Macron recently uh, went and met uh, the Russian president. He went to Ukraine also, and the German Chancellor Scholz, the new chancellor, he went to uh, the White House. So, uh, is the uh, Europe and US are they united? Do you see a voice? within them which is united to to sort of negotiate with with putin because he seems very much confident and whether he's bluffing or not but he seems to be uh, uh, he seems to have the chips where others are just responding to that so do you see us and europe on the same page and within the europe also are all the leaders macron scholz and others on the same page in fact i think europe is going to be the main player in this diplomacy i think uh, while well, uh, the, the what we've seen in the last few weeks actually a potential pathways for de escalation uh, largely from the french initiative but my sense when the crisis began it looked like the west was in a disarray it's uh, falling apart and that there are too many contradictions within the west and that russia could maneuver in these contradictions but i would say now after two months actually the americans have orchestrated it quite well in the sense you have britain playing the bad cop as always threatening russia with more and more punishment uh, you have the french playing the good cop going into moscow and saying look guys uh, france has actually been very elegant in explaining russia's interests russia has a trauma about the past its security we must bring russia back into europe uh, and we can neutralize uh, ukraine but at the same time standing up for sovereignty of ukraine so france is playing the good cop and germany is playing the economic cop because germany has huge economic interdependence with russia so the germans say look you know tell the russians look find a way to solve this problem so so i think fundamentally you know good old marxist uh, we used to say in the old days correlation of forces you could put in might look confident uh, imperial almost like tsar putin but stacked up against the west look as i saying then in the uh, you know the top 10 economies of the world russia is not in them seven of those are with the west that leaves uh, you know that is only china and india there which are not belong to the west so that is where we are so the europeans for all the talk about the contradictions with the americans when it comes to security they have to defer to the americans but the americans know that and that's the reason why they've raised the stakes they've this you no know, nato is back in a sense probably putin's mistake would be by trying to stop nato he's actually helped americans consolidate nato and unite the west for example germany you know 3 weeks ago germans were saying let's not talk about nord stream we love the russians we make so much money there we don't want to fight with the russians but they have been forced they've been disciplined in fact some of our chinese friends say the crisis is going to discipline the europeans go back you don't have that freedom to jump out and suddenly embrace the russians you got to stand with your western allies and then there is poland baltics who oppose russia who don't like russia Uh, and therefore they even are going to constantly demand for a harder line so my sense is with all the chaos the democracies in the end uh, if you are rich if the resources they can play this game better if the if the conflict is drawn out longer but in the short term yes putin had the surprise he has the army standing there but if he walks in uh, he has to play he is going to actually unite the west and and i think uh, that is probably the message that uh, you know macron took to 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 put in two days ago and whether he's got the message and whether he can find a way to deal with the solution we don't know I mean, but but the europeans are offering a a solution which is neutralize ukraine give guarantees to ukraine security uh, bring russia back into the european order uh, you know you can actually re- do a lot of arms control you know other things which reduce the russian security concerns uh, you know i said look out of the five concerns we mentioned you know accommodate russia in a historical sense second you could negotiate confidence building measures that will take care of russia's security interests uh, while russia can't have a sphere of influence they can actually have a, a better relationship with the west as a whole that's the answer for the third fourth as i said neutralizing ukraine will meet their concern no written guarantee on ukraine's membership but you can actually give them some broad you know understanding of ukraine will not join nato but might join the european union so that it's not a military alliance and finally internally uh, some kind of you know put pressure on ukraine to devolve human rights to the russian minority stop you know treating russian minority badly so you can get some of those things done 
So I think there is room here, but but Russia will have to come down from its high horse, and the and the Americans and the Europeans will have to accommodate some of Russia's interests, and whether they can find that golden solution, I mean, uh, it's it's always theoretically seems you know possible, but whether it is feasible or not, uh, that is the big question. Uh, in that sense, this drama makes it a lot more you know exciting than all the TV shows that you watch. This is serious, real, uh, you know, you know great game that is unfolding in Europe. I think, Dr. Rajamun, you've just given the negotiators in Brussels, Paris, Berlin, Moscow, and DC a list of options that they can take to the negotiating table. I think this is just fascinating, brilliant masterclass. We uh, and I now uh, we've, we've like questions. My inbox is flooded with uh, with uh, questions. So I would, without any further delay, I would just move to. Some of the questions that we have. The first question is from Mr. Swadeep Kumar. Mr. Kumar. Mr. Kumar. Mr. Swadeep Kumar, please. If you could unmute yourself and ask the question. Think there is some. You want to pose the question, then I can answer that. Uh, well, we can move on to the next uh, questioner, uh, Mr. Suman Derry. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm audible. Yes. yes. Um, Raja, uh, a master class indeed, as Shubhajit said. Uh, so two uh, questions. Uh, uh, which kind of arise from what you've said. Uh, the New York Times reminded us that there was something called the Budapest Agreement, where uh, the US, Russia, I think the UK, and uh, uh, one other country guaranteed Ukraine security when it surrendered the nuclear weapons that were stationed on its soil. Okay. Now, that has not, those guarantees, have proven to be uh, irrelevant in what's going on right now. You talk of Russia wanting written guarantees. The larger, and by the way, uh, you know, there was a stage, I don't know if that exists right now, when Europeans pointed proudly to the security architecture of Europe and saying that Asia was vulnerable in not having a similar architecture. So are we now in, I mean, is there any uh, rules-based international order? Because what you have so far described is basically, uh, you know, the law of the jungle. Uh, the, uh, the big dominate the small, and the small do what they can to, uh, as it were, play things off uh, between potential protectors. So my first question is, you know, is there a, a formal legal structure that India should be attempting to uh, create, partly because of its own problems? The second point arises from your very interesting analogy between India, Pakistan, and uh, what's going on in Ukraine right now. And I'd like to ask you, what lessons, if any, should we be drawing from Vajpayee's mobilization? of Indian troops at following the attack on the parliament in, was it 2001, something like that? How did that get de-escalated? Did it need back channel diplomacy by the US? And who is that kind of uh, fairy godmother in this situation? Shubhajit, thank you. Yeah, hi, Dr. Berry. So it's uh, two two nice questions. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying you know Russia is uh, you know Russia has written given those demands in writing to the West, and the West is responding to those. So so those are not uh, what I'm saying. What Russia is doing, but this, this is actually the factual situation that they're asking. I think you lived in Europe for a while, and you you engaged with the European intellectuals. I think the European self congratulation that somehow there in this. Happy, you know, remember all this great debate about uh, Europeans have discovered, uh, you know, 
the perpetual peace of Kant, Immanuel Kant, and and that really Asia is still in the Hobbesian world of, you know, ruthless war between each other, while Europeans have discovered the post-historical moment uh, of the Hegelian perpetual peace. But that is look, all kind, you know, all of us are capable of delusions, and the Europeans had even bigger delusion than most of us. Europe's peace rested on the American power and Russia's decline, and Russia was willing to stomach. A whole lot of things which the West did, because Russia felt it was weak, and to that extent, you can say Putin has already got a victory. He's forced a debate, and if he doesn't overplay his hand, he can walk out of this with some gains. But by raising the stakes uh, today, it's, it's a gamble that whether he can get some of the things he wants, can he actually walk away, or is he going to make it worse for himself? So, to the extent that the West today, Macron can stand up and say Russian trauma. Must be addressed. Russia is part of Europe. Russia must be part, part of Europe. You know, we must have a common security. But everybody is to say this. But in a crisis, has forced the West to stop saying, "Oh, Russia is a regional power. Russia is finished." I mean, Russia is weak compared to the Europeans, but it has enough military power to play hell, uh, which is what Putin is demonstrating. So I, I think uh, at this crisis, uh, that that really, the, you know, if Europeans are shaken out of the delusion. You remember the EU keeps saying, "Oh, I want to be." Uh, in the table, uh, at the table, uh, the Russians say, "Sorry, I mean, I talked to the what are they in North India? We can, you know, say we talk to the Bandar or talk to the Madari, or talk to the Madari." So there is no doubt that for them, U.S. and its NATO are the real Madari, and that he's going to deal with the Americans, and the Americans will mobilize. And what the Americans have done in the last few weeks is to actually orchestrate this, put Russia on the defensive while opening a channel to talk, and at the same time, okay, you want to invade. Okay, here is what I've got. I'm going to mobilize everyone. I'm not going to fight myself. In fact, when a lot of our friends just say, "Oh, Ukraine matters more to Russia, therefore Russia will fight," and the Americans are not uh, will not fight. Americans are saying, "No, Europeans will fight. Ukrainians will fight. I can help them to fight." So actually, Americans can do this with hands off. They don't have to get in with full troops of their own. Uh, they're going to force Germany to do more uh, for the defense of Europe. So I think the 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 poker game has been raised to the higher level. Uh, at this point, I think the solution, as you said, is in European hands, and this is where I think the French role as a as a good cop, uh, British role as a bad cop, uh, and the Germans with their economic interdependence with Russia. Somebody can call in Germans confused cop, but you can say, look, they're actually uh, they have a special relationship with Russia, and they can use that to say, look, we can get off this ramp, uh, and we can find something that works for every one of us. So I think the solution is in those hands, and I think uh, they're fully engaged. So unlike us, we could not talk to Pakistan in 2002 crisis or any of those crises where the good doctors from America had to step in. In this case, they are talking to each other directly in a full scale. If you saw, there was uh, one round. Biden himself has talked to Putin twice. Uh, you had the three sets of meetings: bilateral U.S.-Russia. Uh, you had the NATO-Russia. You had OSCE-Russia. So there is a full-fledged architecture today, not for the old architecture the Europeans used to say, you know, condescendingly tell the Asians, you guys don't know how to do peace and we kind of, we have the secrets. But uh, that, that they are in an engaged process today. And, and my sense is that process, I'm hopeful, this is not, uh, Shubhiji, it's not my genius, but this is what is being discussed, that, that there are these elements which you don't see in the daily newspaper reports and that's what explained that. So there are these proposals on the table. And how you finish this, and that's what we pay the diplomats for, uh, whether they're doing the job. Uh, I think there is enough room. And uh, my sense is uh, Putin is a calculating man. Uh, he's not a gambler, uh, but he's, he's playing poker. Uh, but, but I think next few days, next few weeks, we'll see at least some attempt. I mean, even if we can delay this crisis, which is what uh, Macron said, uh, that I'm freezing the current situation uh, and that we can go from here. So, so there is enough room here, I think, for uh, for engagement between the two sides. And I'm, uh, given the nuclear weapons, given the scale of what the conflict could do, and given the costs for Russia, and not just for Russia, the biggest sufferer in this conflict if sanctions come is Germany itself. Dr. Berry, you know better than most of us, 50% of the China, right? No. You know the energy scene, I mean, uh, all Russian natural gas in Europe. Uh, so the, the cost for Europe is also very high. So, so if Putin comes out with a reasonable settlement, that would be a great victory and good for world, good for Europe. But if he overplays his hand, then I think it will be bad news for everyone. But, but there's significant room for diplomacy 
uh, at this point of time directly between themselves uh, and there i think europe will have a real role uh, to play the game in between the two uh, france in particular which is also the chairman of the european union at this point of time right dr rajamon i mean uh, we as leader watchers uh, are always curious when a leader is not there to negotiate and in this case german former german chancellor angela angela merkel's absence in from the current scene do you see that as uh, adding on to the difficulty or do you think uh, that is uh, her absence is uh, sort of better for for the current state of play because she used to speak russian she had an understanding of putin she used to talk to him in uh, in his language so there was a lot of back and forth uh, during the crimean crisis in the georgia crisis all of these in the last 15 years we had seen that back and forth happening uh, do you think merkel's absence is uh, sort of being felt right now look in democracies if you retire you retire unfortunately for good or bad in democracies you go you go I mean, she won't even come out and say anything because she's not going to make it hard for a successor to deal with it i mean that's that's part of our life that you deal with whoever is the prime minister president has to deal with it but i think this is not i mean merkel would have probably handled it better in the first few weeks but but i think this is a deep structure for germans there is a genuine problem a former chancellor dr berry will know i mean mr schrader gerhard schrader sits on the gas from board no that is the level of intimacy that has emerged between the russian and the german elites that the spd because of the war the war guilt they say look we should not, never fight with the russians again they say we don't want war we don't want to supply weapons to ukraine because they feel second world war the burden of history that that they don't want to get back into war it's convenient for them that also gives them a business opportunity for russia where your moral and your you know money can come go together what better than that but but at the, but the, at the same time for them there's a tradition of the ost politic where the spd engaged at the height of the cold war reaching out to east germany and russia look let's settle this problem so germans have a historic complexity here they also have a deep relationship with russia which is a you can call it romantic violently romantic they, they nobody fought each other more bitterly than them but there's no more more close to each other than them if you read putin's speech to the german bundestag in 2001 I mean he talks about the great you know commonalities between the german and the russian traditions uh, about you know beethoven and tchaikovsky about nietzsche and uh, you know uh, dostoevsky uh, and the literary cultural interaction between the germans and the russians so 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 who plays it better is the question so in that sense is putin playing germany to get the west to do what he wants or the americans have disciplined germany enough to put pressure on russia to say look you come to a deal and i think that's why german germany's role uh, in this is even if it is passive it will have the biggest role in terms and biggest victim to uh, if the conflict actually unfolds right right uh we'll go back to mr swadeep kumar is uh, again available some audio issue mr kumar hello hello i am audible hello? yes you are Uh, good evening sir uh, my name is sudeep kumar from yojana is sir uh, my question is uh, what is the relevance of nam in resolving ukrainian crisis okay you know you, you see look it, it has to be you know look if it doesn't get resolved i mean that's what I mean, we've been talking about there is what putin is saying look this crisis for use the crisis to force a renegotiation of russia's position in europe the point that macron is accepting and that you need europe needs a new security order but 1919 did not work after the first world war 1945 did not last too long within within four years it was gone a 1991 settlement has not worked so therefore can you now construct a new compact between russia and the west on a security order that must satisfy the ukrainians that must satisfy the poles that must satisfy the balts and that must still accommodate russia into a european order that i think is the is the great grand design that uh, people are looking for and the crisis has forced that situation uh, to to actually address these issues which were neglected all these years so therefore you you are seeing uh, some of that negotiation going to unfold but it actually work or not we don't know because you know people can make solid calculations but 
uh, in a crisis, uh, you don't know what will trigger off something and everything can go, go haywire. In European history itself, uh, the guns of August, we all have read about the First World War. Things can go terribly wrong. But, but there is a fresh look at European security order. And it didn't start with the crisis. As I said, Biden met Putin in June. When his entire, you know, Democrats were saying, look, don't, don't talk to Russia. He went and met Putin in June, saying that, look, we have no quarrel. You know, let's, let's sit down and settle for an order in Europe. Because I'm going to move to Asia. I need to deal with China. So if you're willing to work with me, if you can have a predictable, reasonable relationship, it's good for the United States. It's good for the West. But whether Putin has miscalculated this as a weakness of Biden or otherwise, he thinks there is a moment, but he's raised the stakes. The Americans have responded. So, so what comes out of it, if there is a settlement, for Indian perspective at least, a settlement between Russia and the West is the great thing that can happen for India's security. Because historically, the fight between the Russians and the West, you know, you can call it a civil war within the West, has actually helped China in this part of the world. As long as the Russians and the Americans, the Russians and the Europeans fought, China got a free hand. And a Russia that works with the West will actually make it a lot easier for India to construct a stable Asian security order with the help of you know, the regional countries as well as with the US and Europe. So therefore, for India, the biggest gain would be a settlement between Russia and the West would make it easier to construct a regional security order in the Indo-Pacific and in Asia. So we have a stake in this. We have a stake in the outcome uh, and that we only hope neither side will, you know, wreck this by recklessness and, and that if they can actually come to an arrangement, uh, that, that this, will be, this will be very good news strategically in a fundamental sense for India. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Sandra. Sandra, Hello. could you unmute yeah. yourself? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Yes. My question is, I think you partially answered it, but anyway, I'd like to be a little more clear. Since India is heavily dependent on Russia for its defense equipment, what will be the impact of a face-off between the US and Russia? Look, dependence, you know, in the end, when it comes to a crunch, you deal with that situation. Right? I mean, so, you know, I can give you one example of Egypt. Egypt was a solid ally, in fact, even a bigger ally than India for Soviet Union. Uh, but they walked out uh, in, uh, in the early 70s. Sadat walked out, actually did a war uh, against Israel and almost won that war. So, so, look, countries, if you're faced with the current situation, you do what it, what it takes. But if you tell me that, look, India forever has to hide its thoughts because you might lose the current supply of weapons from Russia, I mean, that's, that's always a you know, concern that, that goes into your calculation. That doesn't mean it paralyzes you. It, it can't paralyze you. Because we've dealt with Russia when Russia was coming and telling us China is the worst thing in the world. Uh, we're dealing with Russia that is friendly to China today when we have a bigger problem with China. So you manage in that situation. It, or is it clear that, look, you know, Russians are also you know, playing footsie with the Pakistanis these days. I don't know if they're doing it under Pakistani uh, Chinese pressure or not. Uh, there's speculation that Imran Khan might go to it. You know, Russia this month, uh, that is what Imran Khan's delegation said in, in Moscow when they were there for the games. Uh, so if they, if they, if you think Pakistan is going to pay them more money for their weapons than India does, India pays good dollar. Pakistan is broke. But if they think that, look, they can simply abandon India, it's not going to happen. So, look, everybody is going to calculate that. That assuming we say in UN tomorrow and say Russian aggression of Ukraine was a wrong mistake, we want them to find a settlement. Are the Russians going to kill us? And they say, look, tomorrow we're not going to send you the weapons. So I think, you see, in the life, the problem is of being a sovereign nation means you have to take risks. There's nobody else on there. You have to deal with the, the complexities of the real world where other sovereigns take unpredictable decisions. So it is not that Everything goes your way. Sometimes external conditions are not helpful. But you have to deal with, look, we've dealt with 62, we've dealt with 65, we've dealt in 71. We've seen multiple crises. India was going you know, hand to mouth last 70 years. So India is in a much stronger position today. This is not the India of the 50s or the 60s or the 70s. As I said, look, third largest economy soon, sixth largest today in, in nominal terms. Uh, so I, I don't see, India is not a, you know, a, a, a innocent, you know, little girl in the in the world who is going to be consumed if there is a fight between the Russians and the Americans. We can play the game too. And I think we've shown that we can play the game. 
and that there is enough skill and capacity in Delhi today to navigate this crisis. Right. Uh, next question is from uh, Mr. Vishnu Prakash. Vishnu Prakash is, used to be the ambassador in Canada and South Korea. And if, I, if my memory serves me right, he was the first consul general in Russia's Far East in Vladivostok. Thank you, Shubhajit. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Raja, welcome back to Mother India. Uh, and uh, love, uh, really enjoyed uh, your very thoughtful presentation, uh, your remarks. You know, let me be the devil's advocate for a minute. For me, uh, something does not add up. You know, you from your uh, remarks, it would seem that Russia is out to absorb Ukraine. I don't think Russia is trying to absorb Ukraine. Russia is only trying to secure uh, its interests, security interests. Now, question is, does Russia have security interests or does it does Russia not have it? Now, if Russia has security interests, then uh, uh, I think there has to be a desire on the or a willingness on the part of the U.S. to recognize that. Also, the uh, other difference is that the big ch bigger challenge to U.S. is not Russia, but China. And uh, China is out to dislodge U.S. Russia is not. Russia is seeking accommodation. So why this drumbeat of a conflict? It would almost seem that there is a desire. Somehow you are willing to or uh, hoping that there is some kind of a conflict. The, and also there is a feeling that I get uh, from my uh, postings in all these countries that the West loves to hate Russia somehow. So uh, how, what do you make of it? Uh, <clears throat> Look, we can't guide other people's actions. If Russia wants, if Russia can take Ukraine and get away with it, they'll do it. So my view is at this point, they can't. So the reaction in the West tells you that, look, while Russians might say, look, they belong to us, they were really a lost child of ours, we're going to just bring it back into the family. Uh, and that, that's fine. I mean, look, all of us, I would like to, I think, uh, why is uh, Sri Lanka an independent country? They should be part of Mother India. You know, Akhanda Bharat is a great idea. Let's get everyone in together. If you can do it, do it and get away with it. No, Raja, just, no, just, no, no, just, just, I'm just, just one, coming to the point. That just, just one, one of, bit, just hmm. one contention that Russia, if you say that Russia is trying to absorb Ukraine, then I agree with you. But is Russia trying to absorb Ukraine? It's not. That's what I'm saying. Look, Vishnu, why we have to hold a brief for the Russians? Russians are talking to the Americans directly. They've been a state, they're in the statecraft for a thousand years, much longer than independent. They've had deals with the Americans before. They've done the whole day. Do you remember the 70s? They were with the Russian Americans. They used to come and tell us, look, NPT is the greatest thing. Why don't you sign it? So they're, they're not innocents who are being, you know, pushed into the, you know, into this conflict by the wretched Americans. After all, Biden went to Putin in June and said, look, let's have an understanding. But the, but the forces materialized. But Russia has grievances on NATO expansion. They have genuine grievances. They don't want Russian weapons, American weapons sitting in Ukraine. That is understandable. So they are talking to each other. So I'm not in control of Russian policy or of American policy. So I don't have to hold brief for either side. I'm not saying, oh, poor Russians are being pushed into the Chinese side. So Russians know what exactly what they're doing. For us, it is, we understand what the Russian position is. We understand what the American position is. If they can cut out a deal, which is good for us. But if they can't cut out a deal, we have to respond to that situation. So... It is, it's not, look, whether Russian interests are being ignored. That is for Russia to decide. That's not for me to decide and take. So it's not for us to decide who's good, who's wrong, who's bad. What are the structural forces at play here? And what are the consequences of that for our interests? So I would say that, look, Russia is a capable actor. It's been a great power for 500 years. Uh, they know exactly what they're doing. They're trying to cut a deal, I think, with the, with the Americans, whether they're playing poker, the race that stakes too high. They fully understand the problem. And the Americans are also responding to that. Uh, and as I said, look, the Germans sitting in the middle, they have a much bigger stake in Russia than we will ever have. 50% of the gas comes from Russia. Uh, you know, as I said, look, Gazprom, SPD, former chancellor of Germany, is sitting in, the NAS, you know, uh, in, a, in a Russian company. Imagine we do that with the Chinese here. Uh, sitting a former prime minister sitting on the Huawei board. That's what Germany is doing. That's the level of economic interaction between 
Germany and Russia do. They have a much higher stake. So for us is to see this great game unfold and to secure our interests rather than we don't have to hold a candle for the Russians or for the Americans, but but there will be effects of the fight. And, and I think our problem is to manage those rather than express our sympathy for Russia or the United States. Both of them are playing their own game. I mean, you don't have to be a genius to uh, rocket scientists to say, look, they're, they're both playing their own game. Uh, in the process, if they can construct a deal for themselves, which is good for us, because as you rightly said, Vishnu, that look, China is the great problem. And to deal with the China problem, you need a settlement in Europe. So if for us, the, what the Indian statement, MEA statement of saying, look, quiet diplomacy, have a constructive approach, take care of everyone's interests. I think that's the correct, correct path to take. Rather than we don't have to stand up and defend the Russians or we don't have to stand up and criticize the Russians or support the Americans or criticize the Americans. So for us, a stake is a stable Europe will make it easier to deal with a rising China and Asia, uh, which is posing huge problems uh, for all its neighbors in this in this part of the world. Right. Next question is from Madhav Kumar. Could you unmute yourself and ask a question? Uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah, you are. Please. Uh, good evening, sir. So, uh, 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 West has repeatedly said that uh, Russia is Russian invasion could come at any time, while uh, Russia has said that no, we are not going. They have denied any such kind of invasion and even said that such uh, uh, such invasion talks are nothing but just anti-Russian hysteria. Sir, how seriously? My question is, how seriously the world is taking the statements of the West? Look, you know, first thing it tells you, don't uh, read everything, no, don't believe everything you read in the newspapers. Uh, because newspapers are just reporting what the governments are saying. Or the Chinese tell you, oh, there is nothing in the Himalayas, nothing happened. The Indians are getting needlessly hysterical. We just took our line, you know, that's our line. Actually, 1959, we're just going back to what is ours. Why are you guys so upset? Let's go back to business. Get who are in and run India's 5G. That's what the Chinese government says. Oh, Galwan, our hero, yeah, he's going to do a torch. Why are you getting upset? So look, don't take the statements of governments at face value. You know, they say things, sometimes you say it for effect, sometimes you have to do propaganda for your own domestic audience, for international audience. You don't need Russian anti-Russian hysteria. So Russian troops have not gone on a picnic, right? Two, three sides of Ukraine, they've not gone on a picnic. He's moved the troops, he's playing chess, he moved the troops and said, these are my demands. And those are in written, I mean, it's not a statement a formal, and those have been leaked to a Spanish paper as well. Russia is saying, these are my demands. And if you don't do it, so these guys are saying, look, this guy is trying to invade, this guy is trying to invade, put him on the defensive, saying tomorrow he's invading, day after he's invading. But that's also information warfare. No? That's part of, go back to Mahabharata, no? you do the basic psychological warfare, information warfare. We are in the middle of a serious crisis. So it's not just taking individual statements. There was a troops have been moved, demands have been put, the other side has responded, and they're talking to each other. That's where we are. So we don't have to go into who is being hysterical, who is unreasonable, who is being reasonable. But there is, you know, you see the grand chessboard pieces have moved, both sides have moved pieces, which can escalate into, into full scale war. It can be resolved in a diplomatic conflict. It could be sub convention, sub total war where uh, there could be. You know, coups, there could be all kinds of scenarios people are looking at. So, so we, we analyze the situation. Hopefully, Express, we are doing a good job of analyzing and explaining things. So rather than, you know, just reporting the statement. So, so I think don't take what people say, you know, just on the face value, but see what is actually happening. Uh, in happening is this, that Russia has genuine grievances. It wants to best to address them and have, because you're not listening to me, I'm moving troops and now tell me I want to talk. Would you want to talk? I said, yes, we want to talk. So the question is now of terms of settlement, uh, of how do you resolve this question? Uh, of how do you resolve Russia's concerns without sacrificing Ukraine's sovereignty and without the principle of everybody has a freedom to do what security they want? So this is where I think you'll see a lot of interesting twists and turns in the next few weeks. And last three days, Macron, you know, Schulz goes to Washington. Macron goes to Moscow, from Moscow he goes to Kiev, from Kiev he goes to Berlin, 
uh, polls are also there. All of them are talking. So these are moves, you know, very interesting moves being made. It's better than Game of Thrones. I mean, so just watch this. And uh, if you're a strategist, you can have a lot of fun. And at the same time, also see that that how this this kind of game gets played rather than merely taking the statements that uh, it face well. Absolutely, Dr. Rajaman has rightly said that don't take statements at the face value and keep reading Indian Express explained pages and uh, opinion columns to understand uh, what is uh, what to what to interpret and what to analyze. And this session is one of endeavors. We are really running out of time, but I'll just last couple of questions. Uh, from Satyam Singh. Satyam, could you please uh, unmute Hello. Yourself? Am I audible, sir? Yeah, you are. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, my first question is, uh, everything keeping aside, why exactly Russia is opposing only Ukraine's entry in NATO, although we know that uh, all the other uh, Eastern European countries have already joined it? So is it in any sense related to free or open Black Sea? Like uh, in, sh in short terms, uh, trade in winters, knowing the fact that Russia is building, a, uh, like it's warming its relation with Turkey, which is also a NATO a member. And so subsequently, my uh, another uh, question is, uh, what if in Russia's presidency, sir, both Russia and China open their respective front and like a small scale incursion. So, sir, according to you, what will be the India's uh, response or stance in that scenario, sir? Thank you. No, look, I mean, yeah, Russia, see, Russia has been objecting to the NATO expansion. They're, they're saying, look, we dissolved the Warsaw Pact. Why are you keeping the NATO in place? Let's have a common European security order. Why are you doing this NATO? They kept objecting. They kept objecting. They kept objecting. And Putin, after Putin came, they made it even more stronger objections. And uh, he's been warning that, look, this is just going to create more problems. Nobody listened to him, but now they're listening to him and talking to him. So, so the fact for him is, he says, look, I mean, he can't reverse everything. That he can't put the Baltics back into, uh, you know, out of NATO. Some, you know, Ukraine is the last stand in that sense. But Warsaw, you think Warsaw is going to get out of NATO? Uh, unlikely to get out. Because Russian, Polish memory of Russian invasions is also deep. So there are multiple actors here, a complex European history. So if Putin can get a reasonable assurance that Ukraine can't be taken in, I think that's a good beginning for him. He's not going to reverse 30 years of history. But if there is a broader understanding between Russia and the West, between Russia and NATO, uh, and proved disposition of, you know, easing up military conflicts in Black Sea, you talked about, you know, everyone is doing exercises close to Russia's borders, you know, buzzing each other. So these guys are saying, look, remove some of those. And in fact, the Americans have given a detailed set of proposals that some of those will be addressed. Uh, some of those things can be done to reduce the Russian fear of a uh, of an attack uh, or this constant military tension on its uh, periphery. Uh, so there, I think that's what is being negotiated. The future of Ukraine, it's internal orientation and external orientation and the security structures in Europe in terms of military disposition. And the political question, the tricky one is the Ukraine. I mean, how do you get to say, look, uh, you know, after having invited somebody into NATO, how are you going to disinvite him? You're already saying, look, he won't come into the house. But now you're asking, Russia is saying, give a legal guarantee. These guys are saying, look, you'll have to find a finesse. One way of doing it is tell the Ukrainians to say, yes, I don't want NATO membership. Because the problem with the Ukrainians is they put it in their constitution, saying we want, you know, we're going to be part of NATO. So I think it's, it's a mess. But within that, is there a room to negotiate something? The reasonable is the, is, the, is the question. And I think that's what the negotiations are about. And that's why the negotiations are so interesting. For all the students who are going to get into IAS or IFS, I mean, I think it's really a great opportunity to see how countries negotiate complex questions. That what do you give? What do you take? So don't just get into this looking just the statement, say, what is Russia's opening position? One month down the road, what is their concluding position? Where have the Russians made concessions? What are the concessions the Americans have made? So this is actually a great learning exercise here I mean, to see how different countries are positioning themselves in this. The Poles have a particular problem. The Baltics, Lithuania suddenly is in the forefront uh, on China and the whole lot of questions. Uh, so what does, what do, why is France, which is far from Russia, doing more mediation? What is the internal arguments in Germany? Germany is having a serious internal debate uh, that, in fact, if you saw the last few days, a uh, lot of American papers are saying Germany is an unreliable ally. They're in bed with the Russians. Uh, so the pressure has been mounted on them. They're going to make some concessions. So, so look at how these pieces are moving. 
So this is a classic exercise in using military power, using diplomacy to negotiate and to move uh, a, a positions within that framework who gives what. So I think it's, a, it's really a very instructive. Anyone interested in strategy, anyone interested in war and peace, <laughs> anyone interested in how high diplomacy gets conducted. So it's, it's really worth following uh, this crisis in that sense, in that, that level of a detached analysis. Look, we're not, as I said, look, we're not in a Catholic marriage with the Russians, not because we have a new partnership with the Americans, somehow we're obliged to support one another. I think for us, those of us are outside the governments to analyze the situation objectively and see what it means for us rather than waiting to see who's right, who's wrong. Because some of the problems, as I said, are familiar to us. Yesterday, Sri Lankan foreign minister was in Delhi. So Jayashankar tells him, devolve more power to uh, Tamil group. That's in your own interest. Now you can tell the Russians are telling the Ukrainians it's in your own interest to treat the Russian minority nicely. But the Sri Lankan says there's no such thing as federalism. We don't believe in that concept. We're just being nice to everyone. So how do you get Sri Lanka to do devolution of power within their country? Would we do that when somebody tells us what you should do in Kashmir or Nagaland? So these are difficult problems. And there again, take a realistic view. Big countries behave in one particular way. They can put pressure on the smaller countries. So, so I think there are, as a, if you look at the five levels I talked about of the crisis, each one of them has a story in itself. And every one of them matters to us in terms of for our own strategy, our own understanding of world affairs. So uh, I have so many questions, but I have to pick the last question from uh, Mr. Anand Pramanik. Uh, hello and good evening. I hope I'm audible to all of you. Yes, you are. Yeah, great. Thank you for your insightful views, uh, Dr. Rajamohan. I really love the way you gave this whole view regarding this whole issue. and. Uh, Two other questions I had sent in earlier. I think uh, Shubhrajit has already asked both of them and you have explained them more or less. But I do have another question and I would like to uh, want to have your views on it. Um, in last year, when Estonia, under the ARIA formula in the UNSC, had raised a question regarding this peace process, what India's uh, uh, representative said was more like backing the Russian demand. And even if we look at last November, when India voted against U Ukraine's sponsored resolution in the UN that condemned alleged human rights violation in Crimea, it seems like India's uh, all out backing Russia. And uh, even if you look at how after buying the S-400 from Russia, India has asked its friends in U.S. to actually accept it. It seems to me, and I may be wrong, and I'd like you to clarify more on this, is it not uh, very visible that India is more or less backing Russia in all of it? Because in Crimea, it seems to have no, no, supported. I think I, I got your no, I got your drift of your point. You should yes. maybe talk to Shubhajit covers the MEA on a daily basis, uh, probably reports on every single vote and statement uh, that we give in the international bodies. Uh, so, but look, there is one lot in the West who believes India is pro-Russian. Uh, you know, there was a time when we called the Russian agents. Uh, I remember, you know, receiving guests when I was in the Institute of Defense Studies saying, okay, where are the Russian bases in India? Oh, Vishakhapatnam is a Russian base. So Indians are totally pro-Russian. Uh, and there are others in India, as you heard some of them asking questions, why aren't we pro-Russia? We should be pro-Russia. We are somehow obliged to Russia, therefore we must be pro-Russia. Look, India is not pro-anybody. India is for itself. It's too large a country to be pro-Russia. That there is a, you know, UN votes, multilateral voting is a, you know, is a, you know, there is a specific context in which this voting takes place and then they give an explanation to confuse you further uh, to what they've done. Uh, so these are, you know, narrow diplomatic positions that governments take, uh, which any diplomat, I mean, Vishnu and others can tell you uh, that don't, you know, that unless you understand the context in which the vote is done. I mean, look, India today is closer to the West than it has ever been. As I said, trade figures I was giving you with the US, with $160 billion with the US. 
Uh, we are part of the Quad. The Quad meeting is taking place next week. Uh, today, we do things with the Americans on the defense side. Joint exercises, uh, you know, the Quad is doing an exercise, you know, Malabar exercises to foundational agreements. So the Americans are quite liking it. So nobody in the U.S. administration is saying, you guys are, but they're telling the Congress, look, let's go easy on the cats. Or, you know, we need the Indians to deal with the China problem. It's not, Americans are not innocent. They have a China problem too. They don't have only the Russia problem. And for the dealing with the China problem, they see India is important in the crisis. So they will balance between the competing theaters. So for us, as long as India is pro-India, we take care of our interests. So we are not in this business of, you know, whatever the previous criticism, even the worst time, India was not uh, a camp follower of the United States uh, or a camp follower of the Soviet Union at the height of the thing. In 71 treaty, and I can tell you, uh, we tried it in uh, when we had the Bangladesh crisis. India signed the 71 treaty with the Soviet Union. That was like a military alliance. One year later, India said, sorry, you know, the crisis is over. We don't need you. We kept buying weapons, but the provisions of the treaty never took place. And Indira Gandhi refused to go to Moscow in 1981 to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the treaty. So, and that's when Indira Gandhi begins an adaptation to deal with the Americans post-1980 when she comes back to power. She opposes the Russian intervention in Afghanistan. So, look, India can think for itself. And within this complex game, you secure your interests. So, so I would say uh, today our relationship with the West, as you can see in the Quad, is strong. And uh, uh, that is, you know, it's not shaky like we were in the before. But we want to keep a good relationship with Russia because we have no quarrel with Russia in that sense. But what they do with China creates problems for us. What in the past, what the Americans did with Pakistan created problems for us. But India is big enough today to navigate this and negotiate terms with the, all the major powers and secure its own interests. Fantastic. India is big enough today to negotiate uh, at the world stage. Mm, that is indeed a fascinating and uh, insightful conversation. We really got a sense uh, of the complex situation between uh, Russia and the West over Ukraine and how things will impact for India. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Raja Mohan, uh, for analyzing these developments with your unparalleled depth uh, and breadth of experience and explaining the issues to our readers and viewers in an easy to understand manner, especially make, drawing parallels with India, Pakistan, its neighborhood, uh, with China. Uh, thanks to the associate partner of this event, Yojana IAS. And uh, most of all, thanks to all the viewers from all of the country. Some have joined, I know, from different parts of the world. Thanks to all of you from the Indian Express group for joining in today. Uh, there were questions, there were many, many questions in the chat box. Uh, we couldn't take all of them. We just took a sampling of them. But your questions, your ideas and thoughts really enriched our conversation. Uh, for those who missed the this session, the video of this interaction will be online shortly. Uh, to read, listen, and view more of Indian Express's explanatory journalism, do log in to our website, indianexpress.com. And till the next edition of the Express Explained Live, stay safe and stay tuned. Goodbye. Thank you, Shubhajit. I'm wishing everyone a good evening. Yojana IAS offering fresh batches for the year of 2022 and 2023. Yojana IAS has excellence journey of more than 20 years with highly qualified and experienced faculties, online interactive classes, mock tests, doubt classes, mock interviews, answer writing sessions. Yojana IAS offers a complete package for the UPSC aspirants. Yojana IAS ke offline or online batches, English or Hindi, dono hi medium mein available hai. So what are you waiting for? Go to our website and register yourself now. Yojana IES offering fresh batches for the year of 2022 and 2023. Yojana IES has excellence journey of more than 20 years with highly qualified and experienced faculties, online interactive classes, mock tests, doubt classes, mock interviews, answer writing sessions. Yojana IES offers a